All right, so yo, what's up? I'm Elias Page. I'm 21, 180 centimeters, and right now like 167 pounds. Uh, and I just do street workouts, which y'all are gonna know me for. <laughs> it's like my thing. Uh, I do a lot of straight arm. Is a pat. I've been gone through a bunch of injuries, lots of pull and push. Like you said today, it's gonna be mostly pull oriented. And yeah, I think that kind of gets it. Oh yeah, wait, I'll do the do the shout outs. My Instagram Go is Wings Kage. <laughs> and my YouTube channel is Street Workout Addiction. What is your general approach when you're training a skill? So there's a new skill you want to obtain. What's your general approach to that? So the first thing I do is try to experiment, learn as much as I can about it and the execution of it uh, to optimize it off jump. And then what I would do is do very high assistance volume work and just get used to the position and just grind it and drill it and think about it. Visualization is another thing I think is really useful that I use a ton. I'm constantly visualizing and just get more comfortable with the position. And then I'll go from doing it a bunch of the heavier assistances and do like kind of like a general period as a period as I, I, I'm not going to say that right now <laughs> and go from the, the higher assistance, higher volume, uh, lower assistance, higher intensity, less volume. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like at the start, so you do really high assistance just so you get the position and get the muscle yeah. activation. So you know, where is like good form for you? I'm guessing. Yeah. It's and like, then... where, where am I going to be when I'm doing the element itself? Okay. And then after that, so I don't know if you've seen a video I made, but I kind of made a video about this, like me trying out periodization. And yeah, it was, I was talking about similar thing, I think. So you go from high volume, kind of low intensity, mm -hmm. and then kind of transition to that kind of high intensity yep. for just short amounts of time. Um, and maybe your form's a little bit worse, but maybe you're getting closer to that skill without any assistance. Is that about right? Yep. Mm hmm and okay, then, then it's just attempts. <laughs> Honestly, like uh, you're talking about just spamming attempts. Like that, that is how I used to train almost entirely until I got hurt. So when I, I took a 10 month break off of training and I came back to training and I, I have a really heavy band and I almost exclusively used that at first. And then I started reducing the assistance and I forgot really fast doing that. And then pride and ego. I was like, hey, I'm just going to keep doing attempts, 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 attempts. Then I hurt myself. And now I'm back to like, okay, that worked for me and I didn't get hurt. So I'm just going to go back to the, that like curve of, of training with the higher volume into higher intensity. Yeah. Okay. So it was doing too many attempts and do you know what, what skill was it that kind of, <laughs> kind of made it snap? Pushed it over. I, I literally remember yeah. when it happened, I was making a video with Nikolai and Nikolai Mitrofino, uh, probably some of you guys will know him. Uh, I was getting clips for a video I was doing with him and I did a forward roll to Supi Maltese on my high bar. And I felt, it was actually my left arm at first and I felt something in my elbow. And it was my uh, brachioradialis. And that is the same injury I've been dealing with till now. My left arm is actually better and I have the injury pretty bad on my right arm now, so. Okay. Dang. Okay, so it was the roll into the Maltese on the rings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, was on the high intense, bar. Huh? Yeah, and okay, well, what, what do you think it was just kind of like one of those random ones, or do you think it was because you were doing a lot of temps or something else, and that kind of all the in high like intensity added up? Kind of a random one, actually. Uh, it was also in the like middle of winter, so it was really cold. I don't know if that had much to do with it, uh, but yeah, it just it just boom there, there was and at first it wasn't even like pain it was discomfort like there was something there i felt it happen though and at first i was super scared I'm like oh did i just tear oh my gosh i like panicked i was like oh it'll be fine yeah. it'll be fine I, I did a bunch of rehab and recovery for it and then it got better and then immediately got worse again and it would get better and get worse and eventually i was just yeah. like so fed up like, i'm just gonna keep training keep training keep training and then i got so injured to the point where i had to take a month off and then i would come back and i'd re-injure it a month off and then back two months off and then just recently i came back from another two months off <laughs> so i've had in in my first year back to training i had four months of rest <laughs> from being injured
four out of <laughs> four months out of the year I was resting because I was hurt. Oh man, that's a lot of time. Yeah, it was rough. <laughs> okay, okay. I guess just before we restart this call, um, going off injuries because a lot of people had questions about injuries. Um, are there any exercises that you use in terms of like rehabilitation or even prehab, so preventing the injury that you use specifically for pull? Are there any specific like muscles you should target? Like, yeah, what's your thinking behind that? Uh, thankfully, I find that pulling uh, pull skills are much less likely to get injured. Of course, you still can. You can get injured doing anything, but it, it is a lot less likely to get injured uh, doing pull skills. But uh, I went through a big process of trying to figure out what would actually help me and what would work for me. And the thing that I found is for me personally that worked the best is contrast therapy. I would do uh, contrast therapy with water, like super hot water, super cold water. And that was the one thing that I found that consistently actually helped my injury. Even when I was doing uh, like rehab exercises, I would end up getting hurt more doing them than not doing them. So the, the one thing I can really? say for me that worked the best was contrast therapy. And do you want to explain a, and a little bit more about that? Thing it... about the, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, go on. About the, about the prehab is doing the high volume phase with low intensity. Like just, again, getting used to the position, getting, getting it to a point where it's safe. Because again, like form is all about making your body work as one unit optimized. It'll be as strong as possible and as safe as possible. And it's easier to do that when you're uh, under less intensity. So if you're doing that naturally, you can be getting your body more conditioned, prepared and safer for when you start increasing the intensity. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And for those people that don't know, you know, um, the contrast therapy, um, I guess it might have different names, but do you want to explain a bit more about what you actually do for that? So what I did for the contrast therapy, there's tons of different sources online for how long to do the hot, how long to do the cold. I've tested with a ton of them. The one that I think is the best. Oh, so, well, what you're doing is you have a body of hot water and a body of cold water. And you take the part that's injured and you submerge it in the water for a certain amount of time. And then you switch from the hot to the cold water, submerging the injury. And uh, what I found worked best was two minutes of cold and three minutes of hot. And then you do that back and forth. I do it for like 30 minutes each time. And it was at the point where I'd do it for like an hour, four times a day. And like, it's again, like you progressively overload, your body will get used to the stimulus, you got to increase it, uh, you can either increase the heat and the cold, uh, or increase the volume. It's the same thing. It's just progressive overload it, as your body gets used to the stimulus, you got to change the stimulus. Yeah, yeah, I know a lot of athletes kind of do that hot and cold therapy, I'm um, using temperature, I always say like, I always ice my injuries. Um, like generally with like wrist injuries, like like if I have slight niggles in there, then I always ice it. Um, but um, generally you said you do periodization. So you go high volume into high intensity and a bit lower volume. But um, generally let's talk about push versus pull. So does your push training differ from your pull? Like is there, do you do higher frequency for push than pull? And generally how often do you train? So I gotta be honest with you. I almost, <laughs> I mean, since December last year, I almost never train pull. I almost like only do push. I, I do do pull still, but not nearly as much as I do push. Uh, yeah. But uh, generally before, before I, I, it was about the same. I would do about the same amount for push and pull. Uh, and for a period of time, like even maybe like when I had, first started I was doing more more pull than push and then gradually it went from more pull to more push uh I think generally though because again uh, I think pull exercises are a lot safer I think you can train pull a lot more than you can train push just for that safety aspect and you know recovery of your tendons mainly uh fatigue wise they feel about the same to me I can I notice like I can train pull more at the beginning like i won't feel as tired training pull than i will training push but my strength for pull at the start of my workout will be higher than than push and then as the training goes on it'll switch and then i'll get weaker at pull towards the end and stronger at push towards the end of the training okay great so you're kind of how you fatigue during one training session like differs between push and pull mm -hmm. 
Yeah, okay. I, I literally, I can go a full pole training. Like if there was a few trainings where I, I did only pull the entire training and I didn't feel tired. I was like, I feel so good the whole time. I was like, oh, this is great. But then I would get weaker still. But like during my, my push trains at the, at the beginning, I'd be like, oh, this is horrible. Because it'll just, I'll feel like weak and sluggish. And yeah, man. and then as it gets on, I'll get stronger. And like, oh, now I'm getting into it. Now it's good, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that's something to do with like warming up with like smaller muscle groups or something like that. Mm -hmm. and like, um, I, I think honestly, one of the things that was the best for warming up for me is front lever pull-ups. I think front lever pull-ups is like, I used to be how I would always warm up and just like instinctively, I would always start my sets. I would do front lever pull-ups to so, like soupy Maltese elevation presses and stuff like that. And like that, yeah. those are the sets I would always do to start my training. And I noticed that really worked well for me, but then I got really into like the just rings training. So then I would, I would start my training with with bands on rings. And that honestly mm -hmm. still feels worse than the, the front of the pull ups. Did. Oh no. Lag it a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. But... That was, was got on there. So I, the warm up. So when I did, when I, when I would warm up with unassisted front lever pull ups, it would feel better than doing specific warm up with bands, actually. Yeah. Okay. That's crazy. Okay. Do you, do you, do you have any idea like behind why that might be? No idea. That's just how it would work for me. And I, I don't know why I stopped doing that. Cause I know, I know it's a thing too. I've even mentioned it before in like some group chats. Like, I don't know why this works so well. But then I'm just like stubborn. I'm like, I just want to start my rings training, you know? So I would just do the, do the yeah. bands. But yeah, when I would do front of her sets before, it would be mm -hmm. better for warming up than even doing like the specific banded warm up. Okay, that's interesting. So maybe there's something behind playing around with like different warm up exercises that aren't really assisted. So maybe even like if people try like tuck front lever pull ups, if they're working on full front lever pull ups, just as like a little warm up, maybe it feels better than using bands. So, okay, that's interesting. I'll, I'll have to give that a go as well. Yeah, I'm okay. like, you're going to know your body better than anyone else could. So if you can figure out what works for best and apply that knowledge, then that's the way you can probably progress the best. Yeah. And then w when you were like fully training both, I guess, how often a week did you train for these skills? So when I would, when I first was training again, it would be like three times. I would train three days, rest a day, three days, rest a day. And then as I got up into doing the higher intensities or my trainings would be mostly attempts before I got hurt, I would train every other day. And I've been training every other day since then. It kind of just stuck. Even though like now I feel like uh, I could train some more days, but I, I, I've just stuck with training every other day because something that I actually do is I train fasted. So I don't eat on the days mm -hmm. that I train. And I almost never eat enough after my training to get back to my target target weight so i'll take the rest day so i could just eat basically the whole day and that's that's what i do i'll, I'll train i have a training day then an eating day a training day then an eating day <laughs> yes yeah, so your your recovery is literally like trying to fill your face full yes. of food so you can actually recovery, eat enough yes. calories <laughs> yeah yep. i i guess i can kind of relate to that because yeah um yeah, like even like trying to put on weight, like that's like quite because just because I burn like so like calories quite quickly. I know some people will be like, oh, mm. sh shut up, but um, it can be a struggle facts, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it can be a struggle sometimes to actually get those calories in and then actually recover from your workouts. Like it's quite an important one. I when yeah. I was I, the highest weight I got to was like 183 and I had to like cut down my training so much because I just needed to eat. Like I, I would be taking the weakest pre-workout I could because when I, when you take, I don't know if this happens to you, when you take pre-workout, it kind of suppresses the appetite. So I literally had to take the weakest pre-workout. I had to train like half as much and just eat and eat and eat and eat. And then I felt horrible afterwards anyway. I was like, this is <laughs> not worth it, but I just wanted to be heavy because I thought it was cool, but it's not worth it. Don't do it. <laughs> I mean, unless, unless like, it's really what you want, but like even, uh, Wes made a video on how his progress was a lot due to him losing weight. So just, you know, figure out what works best for you. Again, like don't, don't just force something cause you think it'll be cool. I don't think that's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. So I, I guess that explains your approach to like your diet. I guess it's mainly a battle of trying to eat enough calories so you can recover. And I'm guessing you're kind of naturally on the lean end as well. 
And do you feel like that helps with your mm -hmm. skill? Is that about right? Yeah, honestly, yeah, definitely. Uh, when I like literally, so before I took my break, I was training like two years. I was probably a bit, a bit less than that. But that entire time I was a hundred. So when I first started, I was like 117 pounds. And then I got to 140 and I never went above 140 the whole time. I just stayed 140, 140, 140. Then I started training again and then our weight got up and then it was going up. I'm like, okay, this is cool. It's going up. Yeah. And then I was like, I might as well just try to push it. And then I got too into pushing it where it was negatively affecting my training. And like, again, like when you're heavier, that's more load on your joints. Like it, it literally, the heavier you are, the higher risk you have of injury on top of, you know, being taller, the levers longer, which is again, also more tension on the, the tendons. Yeah. So, man. you know, it's, it wasn't a good recipe when I'm, when I'm, Again, like when I took the break again, the two month break, I lost a yeah. ton of weight and everything felt way better in terms of my tendons. I felt way safer. Everything is way better. I was like, okay, why am I trying to push it when everything feels better when I'm lighter? I don't need to do that to myself just because it's a flex when I put myself in more risk and reduce my progress. It's pointless. Yeah, literally. Yeah. I have some people ask like, oh yeah, should I bulk? Like, will it get better? And I'll say, yeah, like if you feel like you don't have the mass and like to actually help with those skills, then I say it's worth trying, but there's going to be a limit where like being too heavy is going to just not help you in terms of calisthenics. Um, so there's a balance between keeping lean and then actually <laughs> the connections going. And then, yeah, there's a balance between keeping lean and then having enough muscle and then not being too heavy as well. You got to find a sweet spot. And that'll be different for exactly. everybody. So again, like as an individual, as everyone is individual, you have to experiment Agreed. with your own body and find what works best for you because what works for you may not be the same thing that works for someone else. And like, again, what I've learned is spending so much time trying to learn is that I don't know anything. <laughs> like it's, it's the <laughs> body is so complex that it's really hard to figure it out, but you have to do that for yourself is the smallest thing can change everything. Like, I don't know, they say, I don't know if it's like Socrates or whatever. The only thing I know is that I know nothing. And I kind of like live by that now. It's like, I'll, I'll say what I think I know, but I don't really know yeah. anything. Yeah. I guess that's uh, that's kind of comforting. So even though like you're quite advanced um, and you've got these skills, it's still like, okay, there's so much I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. And I, that's mm -hmm. what we're trying and to I, do is trying to figure it out. And what I realized is like, again, like the smallest thing can change everything. And then you have to like, adjust everything based on one thing and it's like what is going on it's just so much the body is extremely complex and trying to figure everything out is just impossible yeah so i don't know if you caught my question on... yeah the tuck front lever versus the sat yeah essentially yeah that how should beginners longer. train yeah how, how should beginners train compared to it more advanced pull athletes so this is I think at the beginning, like newbie gains, absolutely a real thing. Uh, for your first, like even like up to two years, you can do whatever and you'll progress as long as you're actually giving your body stimulus and your recovery will be way better. Everything like newbie gains are just extremely OP. And I think just doing as much as you can. I think, especially like learning the front lever, grease the groove. I absolutely love grease the groove. I think grease the groove was the best thing I did for getting front lever. So I was, I was doing grease the groove for front lever, just yeah. using my bed frame. And I would do it as much as I could. And uh, I would just start doing harder variations when I could. And then just keep going, doing it literally so much volume, just all the time, whenever I could. Like I, like I was saying, like I'd just watch a YouTube video, go do a front lever, just do anything and just go do a front lever. And then I mentioned I was doing it with full and I went from getting full to 37 second front lever like three months right when I had started training, literally only doing grease the groove, just doing front lever holds. Yeah. And that gave me a good foundation for training front lever moves afterwards, like pull ups. I got pull ups really quickly. So I had a lot of strength in that locked out bottom position. I could generate force out of it pretty well. So that um, when you're a beginner, I think literally grease the groove works great. I think like the high volume newbie gains, you'll recover well, you'll progress well. Just do it, you know? Uh, and for more advanced athletes, again, like I, I will say, I, again, I think uh, front lever moves, 
pull moves are pretty safe. I think you can get away with doing a lot of pull. Uh, I wouldn't say like the same, like grease the groove for sat, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but <laughs> just doing doing it a lot. I think I do think volume is really good as long as you're not pushing too much into junk volume. Just getting as much volume as you can, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Just on that, I want to say that Basically, grease the groove. That's what I did to learn the front lever. So I pretty much just did grease the Same groove, thing. and then I had a few, yeah, fundamental like workouts where I'll just like do the progressions and then bands and you know da 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 drop sets. But basically, how I got the front lever because I was in the stage where I couldn't get between single leg and the full front lever. Um, yeah, I just did grease the groove, and that kind of tied mm -hmm. it all together for me um i haven't done it with any other skill besides that to be honest but um it worked really <laughs> well for front lever <laughs> yeah i haven't it tried it for, but yeah guys it worked super well for me and i i you're good I, I was just saying i don't know why i stopped doing it because it did work really well for front lever for me too <laughs> yeah yeah so who, who knows it could work for maybe some other some skills other. like maybe like touch front lever or something like that um but yeah, uh, I mean, it worked pretty well. So maybe that might be a thing people want to try. And then um, for advanced athletes, was there was there anything oh. different they should be doing? Oh yeah, it was uh, as much as, as you can. Again, like paying attention to your body, making sure you're recovering well enough. Basically, training boils down to the training itself and recovery. You have to make sure like almost both things are equal to each other. If you're training and you're not recovering, then you're not really making the gains because you make your gains in recovery. If, if people didn't know that, that's actually when you're making the real progress is when you're recovering, is when you're rebuilding those broken down muscle fibers, actually how you get stronger. So the training itself and the recovery are equally as important to each other. So if you can do as much as you can in the training side, as long as you're recovering, then that's max gains pretty much. Okay, yeah, pretty simple. So everyone to make sure they're <laughs> doing the most they can in those workouts. So you maybe grease to groove for beginners and maybe optimizing how often they're training for advanced athletes, optimizing the warm-ups and stuff like that, making sure they're not getting injured. And then, yeah, that recovery is probably gonna be pretty important to making the actual gains. Cause like you said, you had to like, make sure you were eating enough calories so that you weren't just destroying all your muscle and then like, not <laughs> yeah. eating enough to like recover it. I, by the end of some of my trainings, I'll literally be down like 10 pounds and I'll look like totally different. Like I'll be way more fuller at the beginning of my workout and the end I'll just be, and if I didn't eat anything after that, I would just stay like that. And then I would keep destroying it and it would just be gone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Talking more about that as a, like a taller athlete, you're, and just because you have more mass, um, just, just because of your frame. I guess you're gonna have uh, to eat more calories. So how how is training as a tall athlete? What are the things you need to be thinking about? So one of them is like the calorie intake, making sure you're not getting like seriously low on that. Is there anything else that kind of as a tall athlete you need to take care of? So sad reality, it's, it's the truth. Like honestly, okay, this is just my advice for tall athletes. I'm just gonna say this because it's true, but don't think about it. Literally remove, after I say this, if you hear this and you're a tall athlete, remove it from your mind, this doesn't matter, this is irrelevant. Mental side of training is so incredibly important, but in reality, pretty much everything is harder as a taller athlete. Like your, your tendons are gonna be taking more load, you have longer levers, so the skills themselves are literally harder. It's harder to build muscle, because again, like the frame, like when you're smaller, every Mr. Olympia, except for like one was under five, seven, uh, and like everything, like your recovery, you have to take care of, you know, calorie intake, all of it is going to be harder uh, and, and more risky. You have a higher chance of injury. So yeah, I guess again, like when I realized like recovery is so important is like as a taller athlete, you're gonna have to make sure you're really on top of that if you want to stay safe and make the best gains possible. Because again, you can get really fast progress at first, like just go as fast as you can, progress, progress. But if you get hurt and it sets you back months, how much progress have you really made versus just taking it slow and making sure you're recovered and optimizing it that way? Makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So yeah, I guess if you're a tall athlete, that's probably like the main thing you need to be thinking about those, those few things. 
And there's probably going to be more things when we get into specific skills as a tall athlete, you might need to think about. But um, let's go on more to specific skills like the front lever. So if you wanted to start learning um, uh, just the basics of a front lever, so you have someone fresh into calisthenics, they want to learn um, front lever, let's say they can do a couple push ups, couple pull ups, you know, general strength is there. Where do they start with front lever? So Honestly, a lot of it depends on what equipment you have. I will almost always say that doing skills with the bands is the best because specificity, again, like specificity is the number one principle of training. It is the number one high up there, like above all the others, specificity, train what you want. So if you can train the full front lever with bands, that's better than training a tuck front lever because Again, specificity, your levers changed when you're doing a tuck and you're here versus a full where you're here. That's literally working the muscles differently. There's different activation in your body. If you can make it as specific as possible, that will always be the best. So if you have bands doing full front lever with the bands, doing front lever raises, dynamic exercises relating to the front lever in bands and then doing the move itself. And if you don't have that equipment, doing the natural progressions of tuck, tuck raises, or I mean, if you have uh, so the basic strength and you can probably do like maybe like a one leg raise uh, and then tuck holds and things like that and just get progressively stronger doing harder variations until you're at the full. Okay, I, I so that makes a lot of sense because I always say, especially me and, and the bar cargo when we're talking on live streams and stuff like that, we always say, yeah, specific, specificity is king. <laughs> <laughs> that was me with periodization. Is that the right that I do it? <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Spe specific. Yes. <laughs> Dude, I'm done. I, yeah. I got it. I got it. It's but in my brain. With that <laughs> word, we always say that's put it on king. <laughs> I'll, put, I'll, I'll put it right on the screen, slap bang in the middle. <laughs> so people know what I mean. But yeah, everyone says that's king. So let's say someone is doing that as a beginner, but. I guess what other exercise would you throw in there as like a starting one to get them in it? Like I know skin the cat is kind of one gets the core engaged with them lifting their hips. Um, I don't know if there's um, if they're just doing like tuck, the tuck variations, if they can do that. But um, yeah, what other kind of besides doing the specific assisted exercises? Um, yeah. What else would you kind of throw in there as exercises for beginners to do? Uh, so one thing I've seen is you could do the like bar, I don't know what they call it, like bar deadlifts, where you you hang from the bar and you drop your hips and you pike them back out. Uh, that, I feel like that'd be probably a pretty good exercise for starting. And then doing front lever raises, like from hang to flat. Or, or like, and then you get stronger doing it from flat. It's like training, also another thing, training moves in, in all their ranges of motion. Uh, getting them stronger that way is really important. Like I was training uh planche and i was only doing top like the top part of the, the movement like pressing and this actually this was the same thing for front lever when i when i started i was only doing raises from the bottom up so i was strong down here and then like when i would get flat i would naturally go lower because that's where i'm stronger i didn't have any strength going from flat to high so training all the ranges and getting them strong like that you'll you'll have a lot more control and stability when you want to do the position that the end position that you really want yeah okay that makes makes a lot of sense um just to say that that kind of inverted deadlift i think it's called whatever if maybe it has a different name i did that one as well for front lever when i was learning it so i feel like we did a lot of the same yeah. uh, kind of exercises and the same, same like kind of programming for front lever yeah oh well, also i really like leg raises like when I was doing learning front lever at first, I did so many leg raises. Like I, I had a really strong core because honestly, when I first started, I was like training for physique. I was like, I have a, I have a bar set up and I want to get stronger and look better. And that's how I started calisthenics the video from athlete X, the best body weight exercises yeah. and had front lever raise on it. And I couldn't do it. And I was like, I want to learn that. And then I just got into the rabbit hole. And then here I am now. There you go. Okay. Uh, well, what about um dragon flags? Because that was a one that like oh, quite yeah. helped me as well. Did you happen to do dragon flags? Well, I did actually. I think yeah, dragon flags okay. are great. I don't. I always forget about dragon flags being an exercise. I know me, me too. Because you don't think front lever and go straight to dragon flags. Dragon, I don't know why. Yeah. 
but i yeah. totally agree i think dragon flags are a great exercise for learning and i think they're a great just uh stable like core exercise overall too yeah okay so there's another one for you guys that are like beginners just trying to get into front lever and you know those are some exercises you can choose from um j just a quick question what about the bent arm kind of front lever pulling exercises do you did you train those as well when you were learning front leaf or were you kind of more focused on straight arm? So when I was learning, no, I, 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 again, I, when I first started, it was only straight arm and the grease, the groove for just the static hold mostly was like all I was doing. Um, and then I started doing front lever pull-ups, which again, like I got super fast. Like honestly, I went from the hold to front lever pull-ups with no false grip, like really explosive and strong very quickly but I struggled with the touch because I just I had a lot of strength down here. So I could generate force pretty easily to get up there. But when I was up here for the isometric part, it was really hard for me because I just, I didn't train yeah. the bent nearly as much. Uh, but I also afterwards, and I, I knew I didn't really have very much touch strength. I just didn't train touch, honestly. Again, like specificity. Uh, when I, once I started training and I picked it up really quickly, but I didn't start training touch until way later after learning from the Yeah. Okay, so yeah, just, just to say, I, I was the same, literally, when I was learning front lever, I wasn't doing the bent arm stuff. So when it came to learning touch, once I started doing bent arm, and because I had a good base for front lever, it wasn't too hard. Like I did a video on it. So it wasn't like too hard for me to kind of get there. Um, and like, you know, once I got front lever, you know, I started doing the progressions of like all the front lever pull ups. Um, but yeah, like I kind of agree. Um, we're going to get more into touch um, and working ranges of motion for touch and what helped you with touch. But um, we'll quickly finish off with front lever. Um, so I guess the question, next question is knowing what you know now, how would you tell someone to learn front lever? I guess we've kind of already gone over it, which is specific. <laughs> that word, I'm putting it on screen, I'm not going <laughs> to, that word, uh, mainly that with bands um and then maybe some accessory exercises you said raises things like that inverted deadlifts um maybe can progressively overload that is there any other thing you would say knowing what you know now for how someone should learn the front lever i mostly say the grease the groove the bands uh specificity and training it through all the different ranges of motion from flat to high from uh hang to flat like just take it through the ranges of motion specificity and that's pretty much how i tell someone on the front lever i think that's the simplest way uh, and then you can do the accessory exercise as well the inverted deadlifts and some like dragon flags things like that and figure out like what your weak weak point is and work on that yeah perfect so yeah we pretty much talked about those so everyone can kind of incorporate those into their workouts um the next question was going to be bands versus regular progressions. Which one would you recommend? But I guess we've all answered that one as well. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much bands. Bands are preferred if you can. But, you know, if you don't have the equipment, then... I love bands. You should see my setup. I have, like, seven bands on a, <laughs> a stick sticking through my uh, support things for my rings so I can use them. I have so many bands. I love bands. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm interested to see how you use them for advanced skills. That You've kind of already touched on it. But I want to see if there's anything in particular. But um, what are common mistakes you see when uh, people are learning front lever? I don't know if you've trained anyone trying to learn it or seen online kind of general mistakes you see a lot. Is there anything, uh, common mistakes you see that you would say watch out for this? Bending your arms in, in front lever is the most common one I see. It's honestly... <laughs> The thing is, this is kind of already even like be like you, you can't really judge because everyone like there are extremely few people who lock out in pull moves because it's like when you're doing push moves, it's more natural because gravity is is helping you with the lockout. When you're doing pull moves, you're fighting against gravity to lock out. It's more natural to be bent versus mm -hmm. uh, push moves. So almost everyone is is naturally bent in pull moves. But if, if you can try to lock out when you're when you're doing it, because another thing is it is way harder to unlearn and relearn something than it is to just learn it correctly right off jump Un untraining bad habits is going to be way harder than just trying to get it right off the bat. So if you can try to learn it with locked arms and that'll save you grief in the future. 
Yeah, I, I've I've never really thought about that with the um the locking out of the arm. So that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, I guess it's like again, like I can't even be like, oh, oh my gosh, not locked arm. No, like almost no one does it. There's literally like I can think of Monty workout who actually locks out, and like no one else does. Like all yeah. the top holders have always been. It's like that's just kind of how it's been. Like honestly, uh, I don't know if you know Front Lever Fever. He just recently yeah. made a video on this. The biggest hypocrisy in street workout is about uh, front lever versus planche, how it's the standards are seen for the moves. And it's just become the standard. Everyone's like, oh, you just naturally bend in front lever, uh, like all the pull moves. So people are just like, okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. But you know, if, if you can try to do it with locked arms, but it, it will be admittedly the proportion, like it'll be disproportionately way more difficult to do them blocked out. So of course, naturally you're like, oh, I just want to do it a little bit bent because it'll make it a lot easier. Like, of course that's yeah. natural, but It'll, again, like unlearning and relearning will be a lot harder than just getting it right off the bat, even if it is harder at first. Yeah. Okay. That, that's an interesting one. I'm going to keep an eye of, in my front lever training as well. Like for me, like not looking out. Um, okay. So let's move on to touch front lever and front lever pull up. So, you know, getting a bit more advanced now. So a lot of people are asking, so how do you increase reps for front lever pull ups? And, and also for touch, how do you increase the second? So I don't know if you want to answer each one separately, but yeah. So for front lever, again, like another thing is I think <laughs> this is actually another thing I'd say grease the group would be good for is, is front lever pull-ups. I think just doing a lot of volume. And another thing you can do is uh, false grip. Starting out your front lever pull-ups with false grip and then, you know, going to no false. If you're, I mean, it depends on what your goals are, of course. Like if you want to get strong, like on Azuka, he mostly does false grip and then Monty mostly does no false. It really depends on what you want, but uh, doing lots of front lever pull-ups is gonna get you lots of front lever pull-ups. Another thing is you can, again, use bands, but I, I, I really think that for front lever pull-ups, high volume, the same thing for learning the regular front lever is gonna, is gonna increase the groove would be really good for that. Uh, yeah. For touch, similar kind of thing, but I do think bands actually work better for touch than for front lever pull-ups compared to like the grease the groove. I think uh, doing it a lot, but doing really long touches assisted and then reducing the assistance. Uh, the same kind of thing with like the, the periodization with the volume uh, for touch. I think that would work pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So with the um, front lever pull-ups, you said um, high volume. Um, what counts as high volume for you for front lever pull-ups? Is it going to be like 20 reps or is it going to be like 30 reps, 40 reps? Um, you so know, yeah, what like counts as high day, volume for you? I, I think grease the groove would be really beneficial for front lever pull-ups. I think I'd say front lever and front lever pull-ups are the two things that would benefit a ton from grease the groove. Uh, I'd say throughout the day, it really depends on how strong you are, how many you can do off the bat. If you can do one full rep, you do front lever pull-up and then like you go go away uh, for like 20 minutes, you go to another one, I think that'd be good. Like you just literally as, as much as you can if you're like doing the rep, full full range of motion pretty much. I, the, getting the yeah. full range is gonna be pretty important for that. Yeah, and then um, would you say without a band is better? So, you know, do as many full front lever pull-ups as you can and then work down like as a drop set if you can't, can't oh. um, keep going? Or do, would I you prefer hitting set. the... Yeah, so I guess which one for, for front lever pull-ups, bands or progressions? So for front lever pull-ups, I'd say grease the groove, but I, I, I think drop sets have their own place, but separately. I think you, okay. you should do like one full, if you can do one full front lever pull-up, you do one full front lever pull-up, and then, you know, you take your time away from it and you go back and do another one full front lever pull-up, and then okay. you keep doing that. And then, But if you're doing an actual workout for front lever pull-ups, Honestly, I'd say progressions could be good. I, I actually will admit I normally am all bands, no progressions. But for yeah. front lever pull-ups, I did a ton of, of advanced tuck, no false front lever pull-ups. And that got me really strong from, from that was the exercise I probably did the most when getting back to training, doing yeah. front lever pull-ups is half lay or like a advanced, advanced tuck, no false front lever pull-ups. I did a ton of them. And I think that actually did really help like kicking in muscle memory and building back the the strength so i do think that's good and it's way more convenient it, it really is like if you if you have to go grab a different band every time to your set you have a different band especially on a bar yeah. 
when you can just easily just, oh, just bring a leg down. Or if you're doing a set and you fail the full, you can instantly mm -hmm. keep the set going. You don't have to stop the yeah. set to add a band. You can drop a leg and keep the tension and keep going. So I do think in this case that doing it uh, with your, with progressions could be really good. Yeah. Okay, solid. And then I guess my next question would be is for those people getting into touch front lever or front lever pull-ups, what kind of requirement or what kind of base you feel like they should have? Um, I think I said for touch front lever, I did 10 second front lever hold. Um, that was my base for it. Um, and that was a good point for me to really start working on the full. I did start working on general pull-ups kind of before that, like in whatever progression, whatever band. But generally when I was doing more attempts, it was when I got a 10 second uh, front lever. So what do you think about the base or prerequisite? I agree. I, I think that's that's pretty good. I'd say for front lever pull-ups and touch specifically, you want to train your front lever hold with a false grip. Uh, if you have a like a 10 second wrist drop uh, front lever, I think that'd be a good starting point. Or like a five to seven second front lever with a uh, false grip. I'd say those yeah. would be the two good uh, starting points. Yeah. Okay. That yeah, that's a good point because you you actually do really need to work that kind of forearm strength mm -hmm. to hold the false as like your hands try and unravel itself because mm -hmm. of gravity pulling you down. Okay. And it's yeah, actually harder too because it changes changes the lever. You have to lean more. So actually doing it with a false grip is generally more difficult than no false for just the, the hold. Yeah. Okay. True. That's a good point. Okay. Um. Yeah. We 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 talked about both of those touch front lever and pull. So I get next question was that a lot of people they have the issue I guess you and I both encountered, which is that top range of motion, that top little bit of touch, or I guess somewhat front lever pull ups. But like like me, uh, I'm kind of like you. At the bottom, I'm really explosive. At the top, you know, it's slowing down a little bit. So. What did you do to kind of fix this? Um, so get that top range of motion in both the front lever pull-ups and especially the touch. So doing, this is actually, I think, going back to Vance, uh, doing, again, training it through all the different ranges of motion, going from inverted to flat and from flat to like more vertical. Uh, doing, like, I think they call it boat, where it's like touch and then you lean forward and you go back down or even doing getting into your touch attempts from the top and just like slowly lowering down. So you're, you're getting strength in that higher range of motion instead of the, the lower part of it. And the other thing that really helps with that is, is the form on front lever retraction really helps you move up closer to the bar. So I think about like the distance here versus here. So if you're this far away and you can just retract and bring yourself to the bar, it'll help you a lot. Like just working the retraction uh, will also help with that last range of motion if that's something you're struggling with. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that because I think there's one video I made on touch front lever and I said leaning back. So like I can't, there's kind of like a touch front lever where you kind of like hunched over a little bit mm, yeah. just because you're trying to look at the bar and <laughs> kind of yeah. trying to hold. Uh -huh. But then if I kind of like look up kind of at the ceiling and kind of mm -hmm. lean back, open up my shoulders a little bit, I actually get more of a flat um, uh -huh. higher uh, touch front lever, but it, it's tough, man. <laughs> it's definitely I think tough it's to hold. It's so natural to want to look forward when you're doing doing front. Yeah. Even even me, like I I used to be training it all the time, trying to get my my head into a more neutral position when doing front lever, and I would end up just because I can't see my body. I didn't know what trajectory I was at. I would always end up like a little bit lower. Yeah, high. yeah. I was, exactly. I just like eventually, I just I just gave up on it. But <laughs> uh, that's for like full combos when you're learning. I do again like unlearning and relearning something is harder than learning it right off jump if you can try to figure out the best position to put your body in off the bat or you don't get used to having to look at yourself all the time when you're doing it that can be really helpful too yeah i definitely wouldn't say it's like bad to look down because that you can see if you're touching or not or how close you are but just as long as you're recording it'll be, your sets, it'll, it'll put you yeah. in a like people don't realize how important head position is like in terms of the strength your body is able to output like yeah. uh, recently, finally, someone talked about it. it was Valentin and Levon talking about having a like a 45 degree angle uh, in planche, like having that different head position. Because again, like if you have your head tucked, it's not more natural to elevate your shoulders. And that's another people to do a lot of like like fake hollow uh, where they'll they'll elevate and they'll just push out their back instead of being depressed and actually protracted. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that, that a lot of that is consequence of head position. Uh, head positioning really naturally creates different like change in your body. Just think about like where movement starts in your hands and your spine. Like if you get, if you break your back and be paralyzed movements, they, they start in your, in from your head, your, your spine and your hands. Yeah. So those are like two of the most important things to, to focus on when you're trying to optimize uh, your positioning. But uh, yeah, if I mean, if you can overcome having that head position, then that's good. But if you can try to get yourself into a more optimized head position, that's even better. Yeah, yeah. What I was going to say, yeah, I fully agree. What I was going to say was that recording your sets and just making sure you're flat. So even if you feel like you can't undo that, just try and re record your sets make sure that you are opening Absolutely. up your shoulders and at least activating the right muscles if you're going to do it i record every single set i do Literally, every bro. single one I, I use snapchat i turned off downloading to my phone so i can save storage <laughs> i save every single set i do so i can just learn from it i'm always like so yeah. i can like oh what can i make better if, if you're if you can see it you can improve on it and i i don't think like some people were like oh i can use a mirror Again, the head is really important if you're looking sideways. Yeah. It causes anything in your yeah. body. So I would just uh, yeah. avoid doing that. Keep neutral head. And actually, I've had a lot of issues with my cross because of my head. Uh, I had a natural okay. tilt to the left, and it would make my left shoulder elevate. So when I would do a cross, I'd be like this. But if I can fix my head, then I can make it more neutral. So I yeah. literally haven't like have had no cross strength for a while just because of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, we might get onto cross as well because I guess um, do you, do you class uh, cross as a push or pull? By the way, really, it's it depends on the technique. If you're doing a retracted cross, where you're leaning back, uh, more pull. If you're doing a protracted cross, you're leaning forward, more push. It really depends because it's it's vertical. It's in the center. It's a good answer. I I would say generally, I would want to say it's more pull then push generally uh yeah. I, it really depends on the technique honestly that, i'm gonna boil it down to that it really does depend yeah on that's a good answer good answer <laughs> okay well we, we'll come to that at the end um we'll finish off with the touch and front levers and then we'll go on to vic and then vic and sat i guess we'll talk about um and if you don't know guys uh sat straight arm touch um, and then, yeah, we'll finish off. Maybe go to some Iron Cross as well, because I know some people are learning that as well. And then there's a few extra uh, questions as well that some people ask that maybe not doesn't fit into this video. But who knows, if you guys really enjoy this, maybe we'll do a stream um, that doesn't lag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or um, you yeah, will do another one of these videos. But um, let's see if there's any more touch front lever questions. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, someone asked this. So on the high bar, they try and do, you know, touch front lever, but because they don't have that perfect false grip, because maybe they've done pull-ups before, before, like they're going into that touch, they don't have the perfect false grip. So how do you get over that? How do you get into, um, touch front lever on a high bar when you don't have that perfect false grip? So that's mostly just strengthening your touch. Uh, honestly, if you can do no false, that would be ideal. Like if you're strong enough to do no false and you have any amount of false, it's going to be easier. So just really strengthening your touch in general, you'll be able to get over that. Uh, you shouldn't have to need, in my opinion, a perfect false script to be able to do the skill. If you want to be able to have it like consistently and you can just whip it out whenever, that's kind of like, calisthenics like oh the flex you know you can just do it wherever whenever and just having it strong enough to do it consistently i think is just gonna be mostly important because again like if you can't get the perfect false grip or any other you know condition like that just having a strong enough to do it anyway would be ideal yeah. okay and just following on from that how would you suggest someone to learn false grip for front lever or just in general they like they don't have false where did they start for like learning no false well for learning the false grip i guess learning the false grip uh, yeah yeah uh, just doing front lever with the uh, the false grip I, it's just gonna have to get used to it it's gonna be hard and unnatural at first like again like i was only doing grease the groove on my bed frame which has a bar that's like it's like this thick and i couldn't <laughs> false grip on that i was always doing it like this and that's another yeah. reason which was so hard for me is i didn't have the forearm strength to do false grip for touch. That's again, like I could generate the force from here really easily. When I had the false grip, it was just like, oh, this is 
weird. I don't know how to generate force like that. So yeah. I actually was stronger at no falls from their pull ups than falls just because of specificity, like how much stronger I was in this position and this position. Uh, it's literally just doing it and developing the forearm strength to get into that position, get used to that position. Uh, you can also do just regular hangs with a false grip to start strengthening the forearms that way. And then, you know, again, it'll be a different muscle contraction when you're leaning the back, but just doing, doing false grip will help you with the false grip. Yeah. Okay. And is that how you learned false grip was doing it in the front lever? You didn't do it like on a pull up bar kind of thing or anywhere else. You it just was, did it in the front lever. Yeah. Only, only front lever. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't really fall. I didn't fall script. I've actually only done no falls up until recently when I, for rings, I was trying to learn false script. And I'm going to be fully honest. I felt way, way stronger when I was doing no falls on rings. And I even tried unlearning false script, but it became so natural for me. I can't unlearn it now. So I'm just like stuck yeah. with it, but I actually feel stronger in no falls than I do in false grip. On rings, like when you're doing on, like, uh, whatever yeah, I'm cross. Doing, like... mm -hmm, I felt stronger wow. doing no falls than, than false grip. Yeah, it must then just I be really like, to it, I was trying to unlearn it. And every time I'd go up to do a move, naturally I would just, I'm like, no. I, I <laughs> like In yeah. testing, I, I still feel stronger doing no falls than false grip, but it's just too natural now. So I'm just like, I just, I'll just embrace it. I'll try to optimize the false grip, but I, I really did yeah. feel better doing no falls. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll talk more about that when we, if we get onto Iron Cross. Um, that's, that's pretty much all of um, touch front lever questions. So we'll get on to the even more advanced skills, the kind of elite skills. So this is going to be Vic and um, Sat. So first, let's uh, knock down Vic. So um, knowing what you know now, how would you learn the Victorian Cross? Um, so say someone's kind of got their, they've got their 10 to touch or whatever. Um, how could they go and start learning? Um, yeah. How could they start learning Vic? So it, it kind of depends. Uh, Vic can go from advanced to one of the hardest moves in all the street workout, depending on whether you're doing it with fake grip or not. Uh, generally, only one person has ever done it without fake grip, which is Kolya Konovalov some Ukrainian guy who just, I, I literally think he did no false because he just didn't know any better. Like he's like, I don't know about this. I'm just going to do it. And somehow freak of nature, he did no false uh, Victorian, but generally everyone else, literally everyone else, uh, I, I'm training for it with only hands consistently now, but uh, use a state grip where they put it on their arms. So mm -hmm. a thing you can do to learn that is P bar uh, Victorian. So uh, doing it where you just rest your arms on the bar, you can do it where you're doing the pure Victorian with your whole forearm on the bar, and then you can gradually reduce the distance that's on your arm. And the way you can do that is by making it wider. Now, actually by making it wi wider, you're gonna reduce the amount of assistance you can get until you're wide enough where you can't get much form assistance at all. Uh, those, are, those are two good ways. And then of course, like bands, <laughs> I'll always say yeah. like, for every skill, <laughs> <laughs> you can you can learn it with bands yeah okay um quickly we, we'll just restart zoom it should be the last one because we're almost through all the questions and onto the other ones um but yeah we'll restart real quick cool okay so that's how you teach someone or kind of suggest to someone to go about learning vic um but what prerequisite would you say they would need to have or would be ideal or is there any exercise that beforehand would super help speed up how quickly someone could learn Vic? You know, having a strong front lever, like uh, literally, I, I think a reason I had such a good time with Vic is because of my foundation of literally just a solid front lever hold, like a 37 seconds. I went from like, I, I had P bar Vic before touch. Like I, I was really, way more inclined and naturally strong at that because I was doing the front lever of the lockout. Like I, I'm really thankful that I, I was always doing it locked out because I've never had issue with arm bend in Victorian uh, on rings or P bars or anything like that. And I just carried that with me all the way till now going for like the hardest version of it. Um, uh, so just having a strong foundation of a front lever hold 
and even maybe adding some strength for like front lever pull-ups or in touch that that'll help but i really think just the hold by itself is really good starting point for vic yeah okay so just improving that base front lever to 30 seconds plus is really going to help with, with vic okay i think like 25 um, seconds solid front lever like that's prime that's good that's good Okay, and then uh, this was going to be a question I was going to ask is like, do you class, like, do you, do, do you feel like you've unlocked Vic or like, because I've seen some clips, um, so I don't know, like, how, how do you feel about um, where you are with Vic? Like, have you got it, you know, pretty clean-ish before? Would you say you've unlocked it or what? Yeah, where would you say you're at with it? So uh, right now I have a shoulder injury, so I have like zero pull, like actually specifically Vic, it's funny specifically vic and cross oh, like man. my sat strength is still there everything else is still there it's specifically vic it's my right shoulder is giving me issues uh it's spe literally specifically only in vic and i don't know why it's really frustrating but uh i used to do full combos for victorian with only hands again like everyone except for kolya and i guess me but he did it straight wrists instead of with false i do it with false but i have the ring isn't on my forearm at all it's only on my hands i used to do full yeah. combos like Tolik to Caruso, Vic Ray's only on my hands. Uh, and that was before when I used to do the, this was like November, like around there of last year. And then I started, I started using uh, ring grips, which make things way harder. And I spent literally just trying to overcome the difference in strength needed to do things with grips with, with versus without grips all the way until now. I'm still trying to overcome that. It's like, I've had it for like nine months on the 21st uh just trying to overcome that strength curve so uh i'd say right now consistently unlocked uh, uh eh. <laughs> with with false grip i can still do it without uh without fake grip not so much but that's mostly because of an injury but aside from that yeah i i'd say so <laughs> yeah okay i i, I guess it's a hard one because it's such like an elite level skill it's hard to say like when would you class someone as unlocking the skill or having the skill? Like how? It depends on what your standards for it, it being exactly. unlocked are. Like again, like this, the, this is the standard is doing it with fake grip with it like on your on your arm. So like again, like if I saw someone do that, I'd say they have it unlocked, right? But then like if you want to unlock the real true Vic, which is again like one of the hardest skills in all of street workout, I'd say mm -hmm. it's it's doing it with only your hands. But again, only one person has done that with a straight wrist. So it's like, you know, that's that's different level. I wouldn't even say that's yeah. like the same thing as doing, that's not the same, it's it's different. So like he has true, seriously real unlocked Vic and everyone else has like Vic, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, God level Vic and then regular Vic. Standards are. Yeah, it's like God Vic and Vic. <laughs> yeah, which is still pretty elite. <laughs> Yeah, still, like, it's, it's, still, not it's still one of the hardest pulse skills for sure. It's insane, man. If, if no one's actually tried it or like doesn't even know what it is, like Google it, try it in the gym, you will realize how insane it instantly is as soon as you try it. Like, I was I rings. was watching a, uh, a video. It was Danny Rodriguez. He is the basically the person who invented Victorian. He's a gymnast and he first competed it. Uh, and got it in the in the code of points. It's it's in in the gymnastics code of points. It's the Rodriguez, pretty much. And the com one of the commentators was saying, if you don't know how hard that is, go to your door frame and put your arms out and lean back and try to hold yourself up and just see how hard that is. And like imagine you're you're taking cables and you're trying to hold your entire body weight on the cable machine like this. Like you you can try that. Like it's it's yeah. hard. Do not underestimate the difficulty of the Victorian. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So much respect to like you and other guys that can do that. Okay. Um, next question about Vic is how do you transfer that P bar strength? So say you got P bar Vic. First of all, I guess, how long would you say is a good enough hold on that to start progressing towards the rings? And then how would you do that once you've decided it's time for rings now? So uh, P bar Vic, if you're starting with P bar Vic, you can, once you have like, you feel stable, like I, I judge a lot of, excuse me, a lot of progress uh, of moving on to the next move based on stability. If you feel stable doing a movement, 
I think it's it's safe to move on. So if you feel stable doing P bar bic, then you can move move the assistance back a little bit. So if you're starting with the assistance here, move it back, or you can move the P bars a little bit wider, which naturally will reduce the assistance as well. And then you can just move it wider, move farther back, and then. I wouldn't, I don't know if you, if I could say there was an exact point where I'd switch to rings, but mm -hmm. just getting it to a point where it's like, it feels strong. Like you'll, you'll know, it'll have like a decent width or you'll have a small amount of assistance and then bands. <laughs> I would always, yeah, but... like I literally, uh, so again, this like before I took my break, there were two skills I said I would never get. They were physically impossible for me. Victorian, I said I would never get Victorian, that it was impossible, physically impossible, I could never do it. And butterfly, which is straight arm muscle up. And I was like, I'll never get it. And then I came back to training and I had it within a month. And I learned it literally exclusively only using bands. And I just did a ton of bands. I would literally start, I would do a bodyweight attempt. I'd get the little orange band, I'd do an attempt. I'd get the red band, I would do a drop set with the bands. And I would just try as hard as I could do it. And then within a month, I got the skill I said I would never get. Just literally with bands. Yeah. I, I think bands are the, the pinnacle. Yeah. Bands. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got I got three questions. I'm I'm hoping I don't lose them. So first one is for tall athletes. So like, is that something you'd say to the tall athletes out there? Is like, you know, even if you're thinking that's going to be impossible for me, like never. Don't believe it. Never. This is like again, like if I if, because I told myself I'd I'd never get it. Of course I wasn't gonna get it. It was only when I came back to training and said I'm gonna get this that I did. Every every time, like literally, mental is so important. People do not understand. Like again, the the connection between your, your mind and your body. If you say you'll never do something, you won't. You won't. If you say you can, you say you will. You have a way better chance of doing it than saying you can. Yeah. Okay. And then and then my next question was um. So did you do P-Bar Vic before you went on to Ring Vic or did you just use bands uh, on rings and that's how you kind of unlocked it? I had a really good foundation of P-Bar Vic. I, again, but the thing is, okay, I, want, I need to say this. Uh, this is actually the same time I was training Vic with only hands or I was doing it with only hands, like the whole combos yeah. and all that with only hands, Victorian. Uh, I was doing like the most advanced Vic combos, only hands, and I tried a P-Bar Vic and I failed. I'm not kidding. I, I could not do P-Bar. I have videos of me trying P-Bar Vic and getting mad and like slamming the bars to the ground. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Why can't I do a P-Bar Vic? Because it's it's different. It's different doing it when you have assistance and you're close versus doing it wide without assistance yeah. or less assistance. Uh, I did have that strong foundation there, but I think, again, specificity is king. If you, if you want to do uh, Ring Vic, train Ring Vic, bands. You know, I did have that foundation there, but I think it it's, would be better to either do the progression, like getting less assistance, going wider, or just doing Ring Vic specifically. Yeah. Okay. Great answer. And then the last thing before I lose it is more back on the volume and periodization side of things. So you, you said you did a load of like, just when you were doing Butterfly, you did a load of just attempts of it with bands. Um, so I'm guessing you went high volume into like the high intensity once you started figuring it out. But generally, how many sets like per workout do you think you were doing or per week? How many sets were you doing approximately? Like how, how does someone know how many attempts of something when they're doing the high volume is enough where they're not doing junk volume? How does someone figure that out? The thing is, OK, so I, I'll admit I'll be the first one to admit I do probably the most junk volume of anybody. <laughs> I, I do so, so yeah. I mean, I don't even know. My body's just adapted. I don't know. I train for like, I don't rest very much. It's like a minute to two minutes max. And I'll yeah. I'll train for like 10 hours every training. And I'm just doing sets and sets and sets and sets of the same thing over and over and over again. I try to like get it right, figure it out. I'm like, yeah. The thing is I, I spend too much time thinking, honestly. Like I was doing better when I was just like brain off and just go. Then I started thinking too much and I was like, oh, the body's so complex. I was trying to figure it all out. And then I just accepted, like I was saying, now that I know so much, I know that I know nothing. <laughs> it's pretty much yeah. how, it, how it turned out. I was like, oh my gosh. So, but uh, yeah, uh, it's really, again, like if you can recover, great. You can, you can recover. It's, it's all, it's going to be different based on everybody. If you can figure that out, like increase again, like the periodization is going to be good for that. If you can do like this much and you're like recovering, you're making this amount of gains and you can 
change it and undulate your training. Oh, another thing is I think, I think uh, undulation is one of the most important things. I think specificity, and, and I know it's like intensity next or something like that. Undulation, training undulation is extremely important. And doing lots of training undulation and figuring out what works for you and what yeah. doesn't work for you and like changing things. Like, I think that's also really important. And again, learning that out for yourself because you're going to know your body better than anyone ever could. And if you can take that knowledge you have and, it, and apply it to your training, then that's going to be the best way you can progress. And, and just for those people that don't know what undulating is, can you explain what exactly that is in terms of, you know, program? It's literally just changing your training, changing the stimulus. Again, like if you're, if you're undulating, it can be from high volume, uh, doing a different variation, intensity, like literally just changing the training. And then specifically for your training, do you do, cause there's weekly undulating. So like when mm -hmm. maybe someone has a high volume day on Monday, then um, as it goes like throughout the week, maybe they get to a more high intensity, kind of more strength focused day. So do you change depending on the day? Because I know Thomas Kurganov, he talked about this as well, how he kind of has high volume days and then um, kind of high intensity days. Um, yeah. Or do you do it more like, okay, I'm going to do six weeks high volume, then kind of from there. Well, yeah. How do you figure that out? I'm going to go right back to, you know, your body better than anyone. I undulate based on feel. Like I, I will know, like I've honestly had times where like, I know I've done too much high volume and then it's like i i will stagnate it's like i i know better but i i honestly i love the feeling of heavy assistance bands i really do i think it's great <laughs> like that's something i i i intuitively will know when it's time to undulate the training like uh if i'm doing like the high volume it's like okay i'll get to a point where it's like i feel it stability i feel strong it's comfortable it's like okay i can move down and then it'll be better there and then i'll 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 just know pretty much <laughs> i know my body well enough to just go off feel and do that as best as possible. It's mostly like ego that stops me from doing it better, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. And so you, do you, would you say the heavy, heavy bands, you know, say you're not a beginner, um, maybe heavy, heavy bands when your joints aren't prepared, maybe isn't a good idea, but let's say you're prepared and, and you're like decent, like you're, you've got your good base of basics and stuff like that. And you want to use the heavy band. I've seen some, a high level athletes, um, you know, some of the big ones out there, some of them have said um, that you shouldn't use a heavy band, instead use a light band to make knots in it or something like that. Um, oh. Yeah. W what would you say about using, no, the, I, you know, the really thick heavy bands? Would you use heavy say band. it's fun? I, yeah. I love heavy bands. I, the thing is, especially, they are amazing. They are fantastic for drilling movement patterns. Like if you're starting a new movement that you've never done before, like this is what I started uh, talking about at the beginning, doing it a ton in a really heavy band, getting used to the movement, doing the movement pattern is going to set you up way better than like anything else will. Like I have an example just recently, I was in Fresno uh, and I was doing sets. They have this huge blue band and I would literally do a minute, like over a minute straight. I would wait until like my Snapchat recording stopped and I could hear the audio start playing. <laughs> And I would just be doing Maltese presses the whole time. Like for, for a minute straight, I'd hear it and I'd just like keep going Dude. over and over Dude, again, man. a minute of Maltese presses on the floor. And I almost, I never trained floor, right? And pressing yeah. has always been my weak point. I don't understand like the L of, like pressing is, was weird for me. Same, right? same. It's it's super bizarre. I, I don't like pressing. I mean, I like it, but it's but it feels always weird. been my it, weak point. It's always yeah. been my weak point for sure. And I did that and then I was like, I guess I can start trying to do it with some lighter assistance. And literally just because I'd done it so much and I felt the movement pattern, I got into lighter bands and it just felt so much better than pressing it ever had before. And floor. Like literally, I just got so used to doing the movement that that when I was taking it to lighter bands, it felt a million times more natural than it ever had before. Like I, I really think heavy bands are fantastic for starting a movement and getting used to the movement pattern and the position and getting as comfortable with that as possible so that you can apply that to lighter bands and higher intensities. Yeah, okay, I, okay. I'm glad you said that because I completely agree. I've seen, yeah, some people say, yeah, you should only be doing like light bands because if you're using a heavy band, then like, you know, that like that's completely out of your range. So why are you even training it? 
which in certain situations I can see what they're saying, but in, if it's a blanket statement like that, I the thing would is, say if you're if you're every time you're you're going for the move, you're like fighting for it, and it's weird, and you don't know how to control it, and it's awkward. Like, what's the point of that too? You're just drilling yeah. it being like that, so then it's always going to be like that. But if you know how to do it off off the bat well, then that's going to help you in the future versus having to have it be a fight every time. You know, literally. Okay. Um, okay. I, I don't think there's anything more with Vic. Um, someone did ask, how can someone who is intermediate to advanced approach learning Vic? I don't know if you would suggest someone who's more intermediate. So uh, I guess maybe that would be like they're just starting to learn touch front lever or yeah, maybe just playing around with some of the more um, advanced stuff. Maybe that's intermediate. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if you have any suggestions for someone who's, you know, your decent base front lever, maybe messing around with some of the higher level skills. How would they start learning Vic? Oh, I, I, I hate to do this, but I, I'll always go back to bands. I really do think yeah. no, that that's is, fine. It's, it's like, think about it. When you're weight training with a bar, what are you doing? You, you do the movement, you add weight, do the movement, add weight. What you're doing with bands is you're doing the movement and adding weight to your body, reducing the assistance. So it's, it's the yeah. most specific way you can progress. The only thing, that's the only thing with bands is specifically pretending to rings training is it reduces stability. So when you're doing movements on rings, the a big reason of why it's so difficult is the stability. When you have a band, it's another anchoring point that reduces the stability. But again, okay. like yeah, when you're reducing assistance, you'll add more stability to yourself. But like, aside from that, I really do think bands are just the best way to train pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I guess it's going to make the next kind of quick section, which was going to be on sat pretty simple because we've talked about a lot now. So I think there, there should be some understanding there on how you train for these advanced level skills. So I'm guessing for sat as well, same idea, the high volume using bands. I don't know if there's any other, um, if you lean towards progression for this exercise or this skill, okay. sorry. This is, this um, is something yeah, yeah. fun that I, I want to say okay, uh, go for, it, go for, for it. straight arm skills. For like of this nature and on rings full is the easiest variation when you're so this is how sat that works sat is you're you're not bending to get yourself to the bar you're shifting your your scapula to get your arms or wherever the anchoring point of the bar is to your center of mass so it's you're always trying to stay in your center of mass so how you do a sat is you literally are elevating and retracting and shifting your arm so it stays inside your center of mass. So full is the easiest progression. So if you actually wanted to progress progress for sat, adding ankle weights would make it easier than doing a straddle. <laughs> Literally, it's okay. it's like the opposite way. And uh, same goes for like ring skills where you're doing like back levered Maltese, uh, tuck is the hardest version. Like it, it just, it's weird and it works differently. But yeah. uh, another thing is, is getting strength in elevation and retraction. So an exercise that I think is really great for that is doing wide front lever shrugs and retractions. Uh, just getting used to that position because that's literally how you achieve the movement. The mo movement is literally achieved through elevation and retraction. Yeah. So strengthening those specifically is going to be like the most helpful thing for learning SAT. Okay. Um, are there any other exercises you suggest? So you'd say, you said that um, front lever retraction. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, any other starting, useful ones? Starting with forearm uh, bar Victorian and then just moving wider and reducing assistance. That's, okay. that's, that is probably the best way to progress towards that is literally reducing assistance, moving wider. Like I was talking about with uh, Victorian, it's this, the same yeah. thing, but it'll so work, like it'll a straight work bar better. Victorian. Huh? So like a straight bar Victorian Start on the forearm. And then you, you move it wider or you reduce assistance. Like you, again, like <laughs> moving it wider will naturally reduce the assistance yeah. because how the lever works. So literally starting forearm and then moving wider, that's going to be the best way to progress towards that is with reducing forearm assistance. Okay. And then the last thing about sat I'd say is because, you know, I've messed around with like, with playing around with it with bands lately. And one thing is like getting your, the hands over, the wrists over. So like, you're kind of like 
doing yeah. false almost. You're kind of like that. It's a bit awkward. So like, I don't know, how do you get like a good position round the bar? Are you gripping the bar with your fingers? Like, so I actually round, do that Or is it just wrists? I, I do sat differently from like pretty much everyone. Like I was talking about how I only yeah. trained only hands Vic. Uh, that carried over. I'm like one of the only people who does sat with only my hand. I don't actually put it on my um, my form at all. Right. I only okay. I rest. It's a lot more comfortable. Again, like it's literally just it's more comfortable too. I just rest the bar on this part of my hand. So I'm not actually like putting it over too much. I'm just having it like more neutral. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so what part of your hand is the bar on? Is it so like you, just lower palm? Ideally, you want to put it as far away from you as possible. So you don't have to elevate as much. So like you wouldn't want to put it here. You'd want to put it out here. So I just have it out here and it's just resting over here. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> and then um, like, yeah, is your actual fingers, are you gripping the bar at all? Or is it just literally it's, it's hands out basically? Only, only wrist pretty much and like pinky yeah that's that's yeah that's how i'm feeling it, it it's like mm -hmm. yeah you don't want to try you don't want to try putting your fingers on that's going to mess up your wrist and think about it like when you're like this it's way more natural to bend when you can get your wrist straight it's a lot more natural to be straight like if again like naturally bends right like yeah it's natural if you can just keep your wrist straight or like your your arm straight with your wrist uh what's this movement i forget but you know uh. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Ulnar deviation or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's like ulnar deviation or something. Yeah. Something weird. Yes. <laughs> like, That's right. Like yep. Yep. Yeah. So, so, uh, so you put the bar like round here, and then the pinky yep. is probably like because your hands over is probably like yeah. round the pinky. You'll actually, you can see a lot of the time as people will be doing the skill with their their pointer finger off, like uh, even even Victorian too. But that's mostly because of the fake grip. So like naturally, you want again like. If you have it on your forearm, the entire point is you're reducing the lever. So if you put all the weight into your hand, it's pointless. So you want to you wanna leave the weight on your arm. So a lot of people will take their pointer finger off the ring. Yeah. So you can get okay. as much assistance from the arm as possible. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, basically my, I feel like my fingers aren't really on the bar at all. And it's just my wrist. That's fine. Which, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure on that one. I was like, okay, this feels right, looks right, but I had no idea. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good. Keep keep up with that. <laughs> okay, sick, sick. Um, okay, we're pretty much done with most of the questions. We're on to the last few kind of last ones. Um, I think we'll have if you do want to come on again, we'll do like a Iron Cross. Maybe we'll do more. I would love to do that. We'll do more. Maybe a ring dedicated one because yeah, I feel like you've got a lot of knowledge. Um, yeah, so maybe we'll do like a ring dedicated one. So like a butterfly, iron cross, stuff like that. If you want to be on. Yes, I would love to do that. <laughs> Rings are yeah. my, my forte. <laughs> Sick, yeah, because I don't want to take up too much time because it's already been like a long yeah. interview. <laughs> um, so let's finish off with the last last few. So um, <laughs> can you reverse planche and how impressive is reverse planche in your eyes? I can't reverse planche i've never trained reverse planche i literally it was like back when i first started training and i was like i'm gonna train reverse planche i trained it for one day and i never trained it again i just i don't i'm not interested by the element honestly like i don't want to be yeah. bad talk it or anything like that i just yeah i don't look at it and i'm just like wow that's amazing you know i just don't find it too interesting i saw actually another comment do you think anyone will ever get front lever to reverse planche like reverse sinetti on rings 100 percent yes i think they will i like again i don't doubt anything anymore i think it's pointless why why should i put things in my mind that aren't gonna be beneficial i think uh 100 it's gonna happen uh but right now i just don't i'm not too interested by the element honestly that's yeah. kind of what it boils down to that's fair enough uh, i feel i feel the same but yeah all respect to everyone that can do the skills training for it um yeah so let's go on to the next one what uh Okay, yeah, what are your go-to skills to avoid injuries for front lever? Don't know if you have any any go-to ones that go you discussed skills before. To avoid. So honestly, just making sure you're you're training it in the proper positioning. Uh, again, like the body is so ridiculously complex. I want to want to just talk about this real quick. Yeah, go for it. Uh, there they did a study on internal versus external cueing, and they found external cueing to be way more beneficial than internal cueing. 
uh, internal queuing actually showed <laughs> negative results. And what, what can happen? What, what, what do you mean by internal queuing and external queuing? Internal queuing, queuing for... is thinking about individual parts of your body doing certain things, and external queuing is thinking about the whole movement as one. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, something that I that I did this to myself is I was internal queuing and I was doing so much. I was trying to optimize, like how can I make everything work, and it was too much. And then like I'd focus on one thing, and then I this is what I realized: the body is and so ridiculously complex if you have one thing out of line it can mess everything up and make everything else need to change to be optimized a different way so if i was i was trying to force things and then it actually became more risky so if you can focus on like one variable naturally your body will ad adapt and adjust to go along with it to make it work better so trying to get proper positioning but not being super extreme about it like there, there really is a balance yeah. Uh, I think external queuing, like, again, you don't want to be doing a bad position, but thinking about too many things is what is really bad too. <laughs> so just like taking variables you want, like trying to get, like have good retraction, things like that for a starting point. Those are generally the ones people think about, but try your best to be in a good position. Don't force it too much. And I think that's probably the best way to just avoid injuries. Yeah. Okay, really good answer. I like that. I, um, yeah, I've not really heard um, about the internal exter I mean, external. external yeah, there, there was a yeah, whole study a... on it. That I, like, the thing is, I see it cited all the time in weightlifting. Like they're like, make sure you're not internal queuing. External queuing is way better. But in shoe workout, everyone's like internal queuing, internal queuing, internal queuing. And then I'm like, I tried that and it was really bad. <laughs> so, so, so is it like, more too complex? So it's more just thinking about the movement as a whole. Like keep keep straight full body tension hold. Is it more kind of that? Yeah. Think, I, I don't I don't remember exactly how they, they defined it, but extra they literally did no thinking. I think I think it was external queuing, no queuing, internal queuing. Internal queuing was worse than no queuing. I I, I need to like see the study again. It's been a minute, but yeah. I, I literally think internal queuing was worse overall. Oh, okay. Like everything else. And then the <laughs> external <laughs> queuing was the best. Yeah. Okay, man. Uh, man. Okay, there you go, man. Don't overthink it. Don't overthink about. Don't overthink. I, I've literally just... been stuck in a loop of overthinking for so long, and I'm trying to get out of it, and it's so hard yeah. now. So I'm just like trying to spare you guys. Don't do it to yourselves. I. Yeah. I've lost a lot of well, lost a lot of good, better trainings I could have had because I've just sat there thinking yeah. the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, that, that Socrates or whoever it may have been, philosopher yeah. quote, yeah. It's going to come in handy. I know, that I know nothing. That <laughs> yeah, I feel if anyone needs like, to go away. I, I, literally, as I've learned more, I've just learned that I actually don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> you, if there's one thing people should know or take away from this interview, then yeah, it's probably probably that. Just don't overthink it and yep. you'll be good. <laughs> okay, Um, I guess... Uh, so yeah someone was asking about kind of your style um your style of um on the rings really so you do like a lot of forward rolls like a lot of gymnastics kind of forward rolls and stuff like that and then holds into another so it's very very dynamic i guess rather than static to static like um more of like a still rings kind of thing it's way more dynamic so um yeah why do you have this style or like is it just like off feel or yeah so literally my thing like this is kind of where i'm at and now it's like, I'm trying to prove that zero get athletes really can get stronger than gymnasts. And I'm like, I'm going to play by their rules, even if it makes it worse for me, because I don't want to be second fiddle. I want to actually freaking go all in and really show that it can be done. Like, uh, you know, there's Alex. I mean, you're probably not going to know these people are, but like, I'm trying to get Zanetti style skills, like Yan Ming Yang and inverted pulling skills, like Safashkin. Like, I'm trying to take the best of what's been done and combine it and then like be like then like you can't you can't deny that you're good athletes can get stronger than gymnasts now because like these are your best ones and i can do it like them so yeah. like it's it's kind of like that so i'm just okay. like taking after that pretty much <laughs> okay so you're taking a lot of gymnastics elements so i guess that's why you're sticking with rings quite a lot mm -hmm. and the thing is like honestly i've mm -hmm. It's just, it's so much harder than everything else that like, so I took a break from, so 
I, I was talking about training for in Fresno. That's because like while traveling, I couldn't train like how I wanted to. I felt really weak. Rings were actually like really frustrating me and making me like mad because it was just so hard. I'm like, how can I be training rings more than anything else? And it's still the hardest thing for me. Like I got, yeah. I was like, this sucks. I hate this. So I started training floor and then I went from like a, re a really heavy band, barely doing a Maltese press to elevation press on the floor within like a week. <laughs> and then that's like the hardest thing that yeah. you've done on floor. And, I'm, and I was like, okay, I know why I train rings because this is not nearly as difficult. It doesn't even feel as rewarding. So like, I'll take the frustration. Yeah. If in the end, I, I think I can make it. It was like everything yeah. else just didn't feel like it was difficult enough for me to be rewarded by training it. And the same thing, like, I know this is about pull, but <laughs> uh, I, I stopped training pull a lot because of that reason too. Like I, I took a really long break from training pull and I literally like uh, Wes Barkagi, like he saw me doing some yeah. sets. I sent to a group chat. I just, you know, I'm just recording on Snapchat and he's like, what the hell? How can Elias not train full at all and still be the best at it? And it's like, it's, <laughs> <laughs> we were having a whole debate about privilege versus pull. And I honestly yeah. sighed uh, towards, towards Bush, unfortunately for the interview. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh man. But, uh, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Literally, I, I did uh, like seven soupy caruso to three soupy raisin in, in soupy sat. And I, I literally hadn't trained it forever. And I was like, okay. It, it, but that's also like, again, like Victorian, hard as crap. But that's like, it's it's more like the difference between, between rings and, and bars and everything else than rings pretty yeah. much. And uh, yeah, pretty much that. <laughs> I had something else I wanted to say, okay. but I forgot it. I'm not going to try to remember. <laughs> no, that's so good. Okay, I guess my last question is to finish off is just, uh, I don't know, it's just insane to me, just like, because the fact that you're like tall as well, and the wingspan, like even like I, even for my height, I'm not as tall, but like my wingspan's still like quite it's long hard, for my height. Yeah, um, the thing is like, that. that's another thing is naturally yeah. when you're taller, you're naturally going to have a longer wingspan and longer, like longer limb length. And literally having longer legs and longer arms is really detrimental. And like, and like longer lever, more force required for, from the muscles, more force put on the tendons, like wingspans suck. I wish I yeah. had a smaller wingspan. I really wish but, I did. But bro, so like my, my question is like, so how are you doing like Maltese elevations, like learning it like so quick just with bands? You feel like it's slightly genetic or do you feel like it's oh, a conditioning from the years of training or? or yeah, like I mean, you... Like the thing is, there's literally no denying. It's just a fact. Genetics are gonna always play a role. They they always yeah. are. Like I I could be like, oh, it's uh, this and that and this and that. No matter what, genetics are always gonna play a role. It's undeniable. I can't mm -hmm. say or say it's it's gonna be the same for everyone else. But again, like I was literally this whole time talking about individuals or individuals. It's gonna be different for everybody. Genetics will play a a big role. But do you just? put that out of your mind. Don't even think about it. Like, again, I was talking about what I was saying, ignore everything I say. If you're a tall person listening to this, like, after I say this, it doesn't exist anymore. Like literally, it doesn't matter. Put it out of your mind because don't put anything on yourself that will limit you. Give, put your, give yourself as much positive reinforcement to as best as you can as possible. Because that's gonna be way more beneficial than saying anything negative to yourself at all. Like just doesn't exist pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm, the last thing I'm going to say is I'm guessing like if you had that mindset, it's like, yeah, I can't do it. You never would have got to this point anyway if you were thinking it's all genetics. You wouldn't even been able to find out like the peak exactly. of your genetics yes. in the first place. <laughs> yes. So. And literally, again, like I, I, my first, before I took my break, I had that mindset where I'm just like, I can't do this. I can't do that all this and that and this and that. Yeah. And I didn't make I surpassed myself when I changed my mindset in a month. It took me one month to get well past the point that I was before literally just because I changed my mindset like it is so important I I will preach the mental side of training as like one of the most important period like it's it's so important just be give yourself as much positive enforcement as you can pretty much I think is extremely important I completely agree and on that note we're, we're done with all the questions Elias, thank you so much for all the information, bro. Um, sticking through with the live stream, all the technical difficulties today. Guys, you won't even know. There's been, so, there's, there's been so many technical difficulties. We've tried to stream this at the same time, but my computer, my PC, my internet, nothing was having it. Wasn't Audio wasn't it. working. 
everything but you know we made it through so guys don't let anything stop you you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> you gotta pull through man but yeah I, I think we're definitely gonna have you back um if you're willing because i feel like there's yeah. so much we didn't talk about so much more i want to talk about so many concepts so yeah thank you so much for coming on man thanks broski you're the man it's hype subscribe <laughs> <laughs>